Well, the first time I met you, you came along. Hey, I need to, I need to pay for my money because I got anything rolling in this red port. And then you told me to act my wage. <laughs> That's what I am, I think. That's what I think, yeah. Well, if you can afford it, go for it. Dave Ramsey, we good? All right, good morning. How's everybody? Good morning. Awesome, awesome. We are uh, probably a little bit lighter. Uh, June meeting sometimes tends to wane a little bit. Just uh, we've got uh, people starting a vacation already, as, as are we, by the way. Everybody say hi to Joseph. Hi, Joseph. Joseph is, looks just like his mother. Thank goodness for him, right? <laughs> if you're, Joseph's our 14-year-old son and uh, has a, a chance to, the whole family's down. So uh, we had a coffee chat this morning, didn't we, guys? Yeah, we did. Yes, we did. That I missed? Um, <laughs> I've got, it was on the calendar. So that's all right, though. I, I told him, that's, you know, that's how guys, uh, when they start new churches and they want to branch out or something like that, they just, okay, let's have a, let's get together and have a meeting. And then the guy that's supposed to be leading just doesn't show up and they figure it out. All right. And it's like, hey, you guys had a great meeting, didn't you? Yes, See, look at that. See, even better because I wasn't there. It's probably you could tell all sorts of stories and the walls have ears, though. Be careful. And they put it in the office. Meeting. That's right. We know what's going on. All right. So let's go around and grab our vendors and um, let them say hey to you real fast. And then we're going to come back because we got uh, we got somebody that's sponsoring, right? Terry's on her way. Terry Pryor with American Home. Lying. Yeah, yeah. Wait, have you guys heard Terry speak before from American Home Shield? Yes. All right. You'll know when she gets here. All right, is what I'm telling you. So we'll, we'll, we'll be aware. So Jerry, you want to start us off? Sure. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, Jerry. <laughs> and, and morning to Joseph. Also, I think, is this the beginning of the transition from uh, leadership you know of uh, dad to son? He looked at our books and said, hey, look, if, unless there's two more zeros behind these numbers, I'm not touching it. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, welcome, everybody. We are fresh off of a trip to uh, South America at Gulfy Realty Property Management. We just returned from Colombia, where we met with not only <clears throat> existing customers of ours that live in Cali, but we also uh, met with a group of uh, real estate investors in Colombia who are very anxious to become a part of Tampa Bay uh, Investments and uh, along with uh, building a portfolio of properties for us to manage hey, up cool. here. Um, aside from that exciting trip, did everyone see the Sunday Tampa Bay Times? Mm -mm. Sizzling zips in home sales in Tampa Bay area, and Lee and I were just talking about this. It should not be a surprise to anybody in this room that's in this business, but of course, I love the slant that the Tampa Bay Times is putting on the real estate market and of course there's applicable zip codes etc cetera, etc cetera. but one thing does um, drive home very true here and that is of course their their statement and it says sales figures show buyers don't mind living far out for the pricier parts from the pricier parts of tampa and st petersburg to get a good deal and of course for all of us uh, and especially for us in our business we're seeing people migrating also up into pasco and hernando county where they get more property for their dollar, and where we are seeing uh, increases in rental prices uh, that traditionally were very low per square, and they are, of course, driving those prices up as, of course, uh, Florida and Tampa Bay continue to grow. The other thing I want to mention today is I spoke to Bob and Maureen about this recently, and that is, of course, you know, we all have a very significant uh, relationship with Metropolitan Ministries. And Metropolitan Ministries is not just a charity that helps people at Thanksgiving and Christmas time, but they help people throughout the year. And uh, this summer, of course, now that we're officially, I guess, into the summer months, although for us Floridians, it started two and a half months ago. <laughs> sure enough. Uh, they have a program called Backpacks of Hope. And it, the, um, the program is to help those who are in need because there are a lot of kids in Tampa Bay uh, who don't have the money, whose families don't have the money for supplies and backpacks, et cetera. So I spoke to Bob and Gulf U Realty Property Management and hopefully Future Home Realty would like to help with this program, Backpacks for Hope, uh, which is actually starting right now and goes through July the 14th. And I'd like to challenge everyone who is either with us today or online with us to consider buying a backpack. And you know, there's a lot of good buys out there. You don't mm -hmm. have to spend $100 on a backpack. 
but consider buying a backpack for a child in need, et cetera. And if you could drop them off at the office, even to my office or whatever, we'll be collecting them and subsequently having Metropolitan Ministries send the truck up to pick them up. Perfect. Is that the best way to do it is that they can drop a backpack if they want to just donate a check? And or they can donate a check. Okay. And of course, the check should be made to Metropolitan Ministries. Okay. But if we got it to you, you can make sure it gets forwarded Absol to the right Absol spot. Absolutely. And you guys know where Jerry's office is actually inside our office at the West Chase office. Separate company, but he's inside. All right. And in addition to that, Jerry and his group, they do property management uh, specifically, and uh, the reason we allow them uh, in to, to, and encourage people to, to utilize their services is because they do it and they do it well, plus they pay referral fees back to you, and most importantly, they will protect your client uh, relationship, meaning three years from now, the, that buyer, that landlord that you turned over to them says, hey, you know, it's time to sell. I'm tired of being, you know, a landlord. Well, Jerry's going to see on his database, oh, that was referred to us by Nick and you need to go talk to Nick about, you know, listing your home and so on and so forth. Because that's the main reason most people do property management is they're trying to protect that relationship, not lose the relationship to somebody else down the road. And so you kind of do it by default and not do it well because it's not what you do every day. So this allows you to outsource it but then get the resourcing when it comes back. Thank you, so. Bob. And you know, as a real estate broker myself, it's imperative to us and we share a lot of the same core values and principles as Future Home with regards to uh, the integrity and the ethics, et cetera, with regards to how we run our business. And that's why we attract not just Future Home agents, but agents <clears throat> from other real estate companies that see the value, the value proposition and what we do for them and that's why people like Lee, who's sitting next to us here, she's a great referral source, and we're working with her on another duplex uh, that uh, one of her owners slash one of our customers as well. Now this is a second set of properties. We're working on a particular closing that we'll take over, and that particular owner lives in Southern California. Uh, so again, guys, we're not all about just real estate and property management. We're about helping people as well and also bringing information so that we all work together as a team. Perfect, Thank you. awesome, great group there. Thank you, Jerry, awesome, very good. David, we're gonna skip, we're gonna come back to David in a minute because we, he's our free legal counsel. We love to take advantage of that. He doesn't bill us for these hours that I know of at least, and he's maybe saving them all up. So, hey, how are you? Good morning. Good, good morning, Hello. how are you? Good. Hi, everybody. Hi, Future Home Realty. I'm Lori Lupke with 210 Home Buyers Warranty. I want you to know that American Home Shield is not my competition. My competition is the 9 out of 10 homes in Florida that go without any warranty at all. Mm -hmm. Lori Lupke, 210 Home Buyers Warranty. Awesome. Thanks, Thank Lori. You. Thanks for coming. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? How are you? I Great. Am absolutely fabulous. Good. Mm -hmm. I am Carolyn Thomas and I am with Florida Building Inspection Group. We are your full service uh, inspection company. We do both residential and commercial. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we now have uh, four active inspectors and two in the works. So by August, we will have six inspectors available to you. Nice. Awesome. Great. Information is all on our website, by the way. Remember, no relationships with any of these vendors. And when I say relationships, there's no co-owned anything that's we've kind of have gone unlike most real estate companies have not gone that direction actually we didn't wrote that book and burned it um so uh so with that in mind uh we just bring people to the table that we think bring value right we put the buffet out in front of you and, and let them sell their wares to you and 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 do it but uh people of like common uh belief systems is, is who we are so thanks for coming guys sarah Speaking of like common belief systems. Yes. How are you? Very, very like. That's right. See? I'm great. Good morning, guys. I'm Sarah Hash. I'm with Equity National Title in Palm Harbor. And I've been in the industry for 19 years, 12 years serving as a real estate agent in California. And um, I pride myself on educating my realtors. She does a great job. So um, there's a few flyers on some events we have coming up. And then hopefully next month after this meeting, I'll be teaching y'all Facebook for Realtors, which I teach you how to prospect and get new business, really. Fantastic I mean, class. Some of you have no already been to that before. We tried to set it up for uh, today. Uh, hopefully we're gonna do it right after this meeting in July. We have a July meeting, then roll right into it. Just we have to check access for this uh, room. We have to, you know, this room, I'm willing to pay him double what I pay him for the first meeting, 
but I pay them zero for that. So, um, so two times zero is zero. So it's all based on their availability and if they have it. So we're going to try and get that scheduled. But she teaches. And if you see her, if, if not, and you see Sarah's post about uh, teaching other classes out and about, make a point to go. It's kind of like she and Brian Heckman and some of these other people that do some really good training stuff. And I know uh, uh, our group uh, from American Bank Shares, who spoke at our last, uh, did a, a session after our last one, um, are all about educating as well. So that's who we like to bring in front of you, but you get a chance to do it. And then, again. And then, more importantly yeah. than just educating, yeah. we have the best closers. See? In, in 19 years, best closers I've ever met. So. And that is totally subjective, right? That is. Yeah. yeah. Not at all. Okay, I'm not biased. A, you're not biased at all? Hey, that's good. But, that's but a, I don't have to get involved in the file. See, I turn it over and Fran wows everybody. Awesome. So. Very good. All. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Good deal. Good How are you, Francine? Again. I'm great. And crew. I'm great. So I'm super excited because we were invited last month uh -huh. as her guest speaker. No idea. All of you guys that I was going to meet, faces I knew, everyone stayed for our training. So amazing that we, thank you, Maureen, Bob, and Jim, we are now going to be members of this amazing group. And Great. we're so excited to meet you guys and come and bring more training. So let us know what you want. We have plenty to offer and share. So awesome. thank you for the opportunity. And you guys do? We are lending. Yeah. We're lenders. So yeah. we have a lot of in-the-box and out-of-the-box things that we can help your clients with. We also love educating and training. So we'll do group sessions. We'll also do one-on-one. -on -one. I have plenty of people that say, you know, I don't like asking questions or that group settings overwhelm me. Will you meet me for coffee? Mm -hmm. Done. We do it all the time. I enjoy that because I see the light bulb go on. I understand that you're getting it. And that's what we're here to do is partner. Awesome. They, um, if you missed last session, we recorded. It's on FHR University. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was fantastic. It was on... Um, uh, renovation loans basically you know FHA 203k has their their version of this where somebody wants to borrow money but needs to borrow extra money to fix it up well Fannie has a product similar to that it's called something the home style the home style renovation. all right um, and uh, I could go back and watch the class again it's on <laughs> no, FHR no. University um, but it's uh, it's it's all there and by the way have you guys been to FHR University yet yeah. gotta go I'm just telling you if you haven't gotten it, it, we are loading that thing up with all sorts of stuff and uh, we're continuing to grow. Every time we do anything, we record it and we throw it up there. And it's just uh, more and more information available to you. So it was a great class. So thank you. And check it out. one of the flyers here is we're doing the renovation again. So if you oh, want good. to sit through it again or want to catch it for the first time, just let us know. Awesome. Thank you great. so much. Thanks, guys. Thank Absolutely. Know. Good deal. Anybody else? Terry, we're coming back to you in a second. Terry is here in the house. All right. Um, David, you got a second? Right now? Yeah, okay, let's go. Come sure. on. All right, sure let's do this. All right. Okay. Where are we going to do this? We're going to go right up here. Okay. All right. So David Rankin, you know, this is our, uh, what do you call it? Stump the chump kind of thing? Stump the chimp. Yeah, it's stump the chimp. There it is. All right. Um, I'm not sure why they say chimp. I, I asked them about that. I didn't know it. <laughs> Very good. Dave and, I, Dave and I talk a lot because you guys are messy. I am telling you. All right, you guys find more issues than I. What in the world? How did you step in that? All right, Jiminy, is it not? Was it not right in front of you? I mean, take a step to the side and avoid that. It. I'm just teasing. Um, but it amazes us, doesn't it, David? Truly, it truly amazes us. Um, what what we see and what we hear. And so Dave and I have had some uh, discussions. And in our 100K group page thread, there was a, a pretty good thread going the other day about uh, buyer wanted to cancel. We had the listing, right? So it was our, our listing agent. Buyer wanted to cancel, but there was a dispute over the escrow. And so our agent wanted to activate the listing. Say, hey, look, I don't want to, my buyer, my seller doesn't want to sign this release and cancellation because the release, release and cancellation has the money going back to the buyer. We're disputing that. We think the money should go back to the seller. And my point was, okay, but unless your seller signs that cancellation and, or there's some type of agreement, what's going to happen now, then you're still under contract. Because without a signed cancellation, with all parties agreeing that this is how the cancellation is going to be handled, we're under contract up until the day that uh, the closing date comes and goes and there's no closing. Then the contract is basically expired and we can re-market uh, the property up until, I mean, uh, any time, even though we're still disputing the old escrow money. Are you with me so far? Can you see that whole tr uh, transpiring? Well, listing agents don't like that, right? They want to get it back on the market right away. This buyer has obviously made their intentions clear that they want to cancel the contract, right? 
My contention is, is that yeah, the buyer though has made a offer to cancel, but in that offer to cancel, it says buyer gets the money. That's usually the way the buyers cancel, right? You understand that, okay? They're not gonna say, oh yeah, I wanna cancel, and by the way, I know I lose my money. Okay, the contract says that a lot of times, but the buyers don't always agree with the contract even though the ones signed it. All right, that being said, David and I had a discussion about, okay, is there a separation of the release and cancellation? Is there a cancellation of a contract yet still disputing the earnest money that then would allow a seller to remarket the property even prior to the closing date coming and going? Because my point is still is that as a buyer, I might say, yeah, I'm willing to cancel if I get my money back. But if you're not gonna give me my money back, I'm not so sure I wanna cancel, right? I think that's why both of those items are on the form. And so David and I had a discussion of, well, is there a way, right, that we could, and we kind of talked through this a little bit, David, and you have, any, had you, have you looked over this thing any further to give us some ideas? I sure have. I want to assure everybody that, that Bob mentions no names, all right? There's no, there's no degree of oh, that's right. <laughs> and it's all confidential, Bob. You know, I say, well, Bob, well, who is it? He says, I can't tell you that, David. It'd, it'd be too embarrassing. So anyway, so the secret, the secret is kept with Save with that, exactly. Okay, perfect. All right. all right. Here we go. So what do you think? So <clears throat> why don't I do, you hold this? I do think... Uh, as a matter of fact, I know, I, I can tell you exactly what, what needs to be done here so that, uh, let's say you're the listing agent and you're thinking, okay, whoa, we wanna, you know, these people are saying we don't wanna move forward. We do not wanna move forward. Uh, we couldn't get financing. We don't like uh, dealing with you. We don't like dealing with you. What, for whatever reason, they say, okay, so here's, here's a way to do it. This form, everybody thinks it's a release and cancellation, all right? You got two issues. You got the release of the escrow and you got the cancellation of the contract. But that doesn't mean it cannot be, and here's the word for the day, bifurcated, all right? That has nothing to do with gastronomic uh, whatever, <laughs> okay? Yeah, so, a 14 year old gets that. there we go, bifurcated, bifurcated. But anyway, at the top it says the, uh, it says uh, by signing this release and cancellation, see there's the word cancellation. What you want to do is step number one, you want to do cancellation. It appears that there's a meeting in the minds that you want to cancel. And that is what you want to make sure that is done because if you're the listing agent and you want to put it back on the market, you want to make sure that that, that language is there. Let me step in too. Sure. Because a lot of times, here's what happens. Let's say we go remarket the property and in today's market we get another offer in two days, right? We go to contract, now all of a sudden buyer number one says, hey look, we never fully canceled this thing. We have rights to a contract on it. Buyer number two says, hey, what the heck? Right? I've got rights to a contract on this. Sounds like the seller has sold it twice to me. Right? And we want to absolutely avoid being in a we sold it twice scenario. All right? So you got to be very, very careful in this uh, uh, concept. So big picture, just think of this as two separate uh, documents, even though it's one. At the top it says uh, release and cancellation. All right, that's what that's exactly what you want to accomplish. Could you had a contract, or at the time you're thinking about this, you have a contract, and if you're the listing agent, you want to put it back on the market, you want to cancel that comp, uh, contract. You want to terminate whatever rights either party has to that contract, but you want to make sure that everybody knows, most especially the title company that's holding the escrow funds, that there is a dispute, there is an escrow dispute. All right, so what you do is you fill out the top and then you, the buyer and seller, release each other together with the affiliates. But down at the bottom, the third paragraph, what you do is you put a line through there and you put, there is a, a, an escrow dispute between the buyer and seller. All right, so what you've accomplished is that you have canceled the contract, but you have, both sides have agreed by signing this that there is a dispute as to the who's entitled to the escrow, and then you can share that with the title company or whoever it is that's uh, holding the escrow. Make sure that they receive it and they send back an acknowledgement that they have received it, acknowledging that there is an escrow dispute. And then, if you're the listing agent, then because you've canceled the contract and the buyer, uh, buyers and sellers, however many parties there are, have signed it, you have put yourself in a situation where the property can be put back on the market. You avoid what Bob is talking about where, okay, we're really excited, we've signed, 
and we, we moved on, we signed a second contract, and then somebody comes back and says, wait a minute, wait a minute, we never terminated. And then you say, well, I thought you said, you know, there's no I thought you said, it's you signed this document, it says that contract is terminated, and there is a dispute. All right. Now, again, more than likely, the release and cancellation came in without that with buyer getting the money, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're going to cross through that and cancel it, then obviously all interested parties need to initial that amendment or that change to that. And up until that point that we have a meeting of the minds, that all parties have agreed, we are canceling the contract, yet there's a dispute on escrow, mm -hmm. then I would allow you to remarket if you're the listing agent remarket the property is active and, and, and move forward. Um, a good illustration of this is uh, many times uh, buyers who have missed their financing contingency okay, or their loan approval period now because we're dealing in the new contract, it's no longer loan commitment, the loan approval, right? Where they've missed the loan approval deadline and were past even, if you go to the Section 8 class on the FHR University, you have to FHR University, um, Section uh, uh, 8 contract, it says 30 days, and then we have an additional 33-day window now that you know, it's only a unilateral right to cancel now, a three-day window that the seller has at the end of that 30 days, or whatever the loan approval deadline is negotiated to, all right? And then after that, we're heading to closing. So let's say and we're in that heading to closing window, okay, day 33 to day 45, and all of a sudden the buyer says, oh, you know what? We just found out we're not getting our, our loan. And your point is, well, guess what? Should have told us on day 29, not day 34, right? Sorry to hear that, but it's you've now lost your finance. So the buyer say, well, we can't close, so we want to cancel. The seller says, well, I'm disputing the escrow. You want the money back, but I say the contract says you don't get the money back. And so we're going to keep that money. Well, then the buyer says, well, in that case, contract says we're headed to closing because we don't have an agreed upon cancellation of contract. And lo and behold, all right, they take the money that they were going to use for their down payment and seven come 11, baby needs new Cole Hans and they get hot at the table. And next thing you know, they're ready to pay cash for this house, right? So they come back to you on day 44 because they hit the lottery and say, hey, we're ready to close. And you're like, oh, but you wanted to cancel. Yeah, but you didn't agree to it. Yeah, but I sold it to somebody. Uh, too bad. I still have a contract. All right? That's why it's imperative that we have an agreement. And this is, and I, David and I talked about this verbiage that I'm okay and he's okay with. Hey, look, we all agree it's canceled, but we also all agree that there is no agreement at this point on how the money's going to be dispersed. But at least you can go buy a new property and we can go uh, sell it to somebody else. And in the meantime, we'll fight over the money later. So you mark through and then right in, there is an escrow dispute and then have the other agents uh, initial, have all the parties initial, and then make sure to forward that to whoever is holding the uh, escrow and have them send back acknowledging that they've received it and they understand that they are to uh, retain the escrow pending resolution of the dispute. Jim? Um, this one's coming from my line, but I, I kind of see this a lot too anyway, so it's a good one to bring up. But uh, no escrow put in. We get that a lot right now. Yep. We get beyond the, the three days or whatever many days they gave, yep. and escrow has not been given, and I guess... Does that nullify the contract, or the way I read the contract, and you, again, mm -hmm. I'm not an attorney, I just play one on TV, <laughs> but, um, and I don't charge nearly as much as these guys. Okay. Uh, the, <laughs> the, um, does it nullify the contract, or the way I read the contract, it says that the seller can continue on with specific performance, basically, and it'd be, look at it as a buyer default, but it doesn't necessarily void the contract. Yes or no? Well, actually, the, there's, no, there's no enforceable contract until there's an offer, mm -hmm. acceptance, which is the contract signed, right. and consideration. Okay. All right. If there was no deposit paid, then there was no consideration, so there never was a contract. So even the promise of consideration the promise? Yeah, like, hey, I'm going to pay in three days. Right? Oh, I'm going to pay you in three days. Okay. 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 Is that non-delivery of that on day three? Uh -huh. Right. So we're at day four. Are you saying we're, there is no contract and the seller could there resell? Is no, there, now, there are all kinds of uh, <laughs> very ethereal arguments about um, uh, reliance and, uh, but 
the general rule is that if you uh, sign a contract, offer acceptance and consideration, until that, until that check is received by the title company or until the wire is received by the title company, there is no enforceable contract. So does that therefore mean that if the non-delivery of earnest money, mm -hmm. right, yep. that there is no contract, so therefore I can't really even hold this seller or this buyer responsible or try and come after this money that's not there? Well, now of course, uh, the, the argument when you're on th that side, that yeah. you want to go after them. We do this back and forth. Who's on first? Mum, mum is the word about no enforceable contract. But, uh, you know, an argument could be made, you know, there are arguments that can be made. The, pr the problem is you never, you never get to fast forward in front of somebody who can make a ruling. These things never go to, never go to court. There is no, you know, the next step is uh, mediation. And of course, you know, the, the cost and the uh, time involved in going to mediation usually outweighs the amount of the deposit. All right. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, was that the question? Are we in? Are we out of contract, or is there no is no contract for non delivery? Is that that they're asking? Kind of, yeah. I mean, yeah. what I teach in, the, in my contract classes, if you hit day three and they don't deposit the money, cancel the contract, or just withdraw and say, hey, we're going with somebody else, even though you may not have one. Just cancel it and tell the buyer you're out. And then if they say, no, no, we got it, say, well, you got like an hour to put it in. Go do right. it now, or we're out. We're out. Well, you can say, as soon as you say the word cancel, that makes makes you think that mm -hmm. there is a cancel, but you know, right, right. You know, withdraw. What I, yeah, withdraw. what I what I would what I would recommend is that the re, the contract, you know, what, it's not enforceable until you pay the escrow money or deliver the escrow money. You never did. Never was a contract. We're moving on. And if they That's didn't do it in time, yeah. let's say they said, oh, you know what? I forgot all about it, and the mail was slow, and here it is on day four. But you've already notified we are. Mm -hmm. Considering the contract, this mm -hmm. offer null and void mm -hmm. due to non-delivery of earnest money, mm -hmm. is the seller safe in saying, "Hey, look, you didn't do it in the in the pre prescribed time frame." Right. So the seller's already. Guess what? Ironically, we went on. We had a multiple offer situation, and we had eight other offers. Yeah. And somebody else came back and said, "Hey, look, anything does it. My guy really, really wants it." And I'm talking like really, like ten thousand more, kind of really, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so your but seller's sitting there. <laughs> Okay, okay. It's like calling you at 501. Am I right there? Am I there? I'm not there. Not there? All right, that guy's out. We're in with the new offer, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yes? I mean, defendable? If they, if there never was any escrow money paid, yeah. there never was any enforceable contract. Okay. Right. Which now, on, on the flip side, if you're on the buyer side, okay. yeah. what, is, what does that mean? It means you got to make sure that the, the money is, or the check, or the money is delivered yep. within that time frame. Otherwise, they can, you know, maybe they're watching online or they heard it, whatever, they'll say, whoops, you know, there never was an enforceable contract, we're moving on. So if you're on the buyer's side, you have to make absolutely certain and you tell your buyer that, hey, I, you know, I need to get that uh, check. If we don't get it in, we, we're, we're lost. We do not have a contract now. Right. Now, exactly. what, happens, what happens when uh, you go too long, like uh, past inspections, mm -hmm. and the, the seller has didn't really care, or they weren't paying attention, mm -hmm. the escrow was never deposited, now you're past inspection period, and the buyer cancels, and the seller says, well, no, I want to keep the escrow, because your past inspections, you just can't walk away, and they have no reason to walk away. But then the buyer plays that card. They say, "Well, there was never a contract because we never put escrow in." So that's when that happens a lot too. Well, that's the agent's fault. Yeah, that's yeah. 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 true. It's not well, the seller's fault. Yeah. On the on the fourth day, let's say let's say the the contract requires uh, the escrow yep. within three days. All right, the the fourth, the fifth, the further you get into it the less uh, black and white it is, all right? Because the argument that the, that the buyer has is that we relied, we, to our detriment, we relied upon this being a contract. And we did this, we spent this money, so it gets more gray, all right? So if you forget, you know, forgetting is not a good, not a good thing to, uh, not a good principle to follow, all right? You should know your timelines on the fourth day. If you're going to cancel it, cancel it. Because if you get into the eighth, ninth, tenth, they spend time, they spend money. Then well, the, the flip side, though. Excuse me. This is the, what I'm asking is the flip side. The okay. seller wants their escrow now, right? And it was never put in. So the buyer says, "Oh, come after me. I never, I never deposited. Well, have a nice day." To, to some to some extent, possession is nine tenths of the law. Mm -hmm. If you don't have money in an account then all you can hope for is to get a judgment, spend a lot of money to get a judgment. Yeah. 
<laughs> so, so that's why it's a, one of the you know probably reason number 85, 84. We'll get to the you know all the 84 first ones will, but 85 would be if you don't get if you don't make sure the escrow is there and you have a dispute, there's you know who's going to be mad at you, your client, because you didn't make sure that the escrow was there. Right. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, that, to David's point, he's like trying. Okay, we've got to do the escrow as a buyer's agent. Start spending this money, and all of a sudden the seller gets a better offer or quote unquote backup and says, huh, we just realized there's no escrow. So when we're past the three day window, but we're now at day 10 or 12, David's saying there is some court, some legal proceedings that say, hey, look, you were proceeding as if. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so there would be the buyer's defense there saying, well, uh, yeah, we forgot, you know, and so on and so forth. So, needless to say, pay attention to the earnest money. The earnest money is imperative to making a contract a contract instead of just a, an offer until it's fully ratified. And all parties, whether you represent the buyer or the seller, all right, the end goal is to get a closing here, right? So, if you're on the other, whatever side you're on, make sure you're doing your due diligence to make it happen. Okay, what? Chevelle, and then we'll come back to Sam. Or Sam, let's go first. In this scenario where the, the buyer and seller agree to cancel and you write in that there's an escrow sure. dispute, yep. what is the agent's responsibility at that point? I mean, do, are we involved in the... An escrow dispute? Yeah. No way. Okay, so are we like separate? I give him David's number. Come say here's David, here's, here's David Rankin's number. Okay. All right, if you want to come to our office meeting, you can maybe talk to him for free, but you can't, so you're going to allow you in. So, so call him when he's on his dime and he's got the meter running. That's right. Um, and uh, seriously, because it's between them. That's why we don't have an escrow account. Okay, so at that point, what we would say to our client is, okay, you need to contact an attorney. Yeah. Seek legal counsel, we're done. right? And we don't have to worry about, you know, contacting the, after they, the title company has that form. We don't have to worry about contacting them again with the resolution or what. We're done. Well, you can still be involved if you're involved with your client because your client still may want to buy a house or right, sell their right. home, right? So you're probably still involved somewhat. Right. But you have no legal obligation and and that's why it's very confusing because when we take 14 hour continuing ed and we take our pre-licensing, it's all about we have to memorize all this stuff about when the time frame is for an escrow disbursement order and all that kind of stuff, which has nothing to do with any of this. Because an EDO only applies when the real estate company is holding the, the, the uh, uh, escrow money, which no, almost none of us hold it anymore, all right? I never have, but almost every real estate company says, just let the title companies deal with it, all right? Let's go, Chevelle, do you still have yours or you got it? Yes. So you indicated that you don't have an enforceable contract until the escrow has been deposited. So in, in an offer and an acceptance, which people call a contract, typically you know the default is in three days, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're saying that there's no enforceable contract until the escrow has been deposited, so on day two, some another buyer came and wanted to put in an offer, are you suggesting that that seller is free, if the, if the escrow has not been deposited, that seller is free to accept a different offer? Well, I tell you what, that would be um, that would be holy. I mean, I, I would say this: there's a, so there's such an expectation in the industry that when there's a there's a signature and there are a certain number of days that the contract allows for. I, I think what the answer as I as I talk through that, I think there, there's also an indication where they have an opportunity to, to sign, and then there's a period of time within which the escrow can be, can be paid. All right, it's so I specified. Say, no, you're, I would, you're safe. I think, I think this, is what this is how I describe it in the class. I, I, I say you, you've allowed them three days to get Correct. it in. Mm -hmm. so Correct. That's the, so you are under contract because you've allowed it, so they get that time to put it in mm -hmm. because you've yep. agreed to it. That's it's correct. an agreement, a mutual agreement mm -hmm. to give them that amount. We're working around, so I've got some Sorry. earlier hand. That's good, that's good, okay? Yes? Don't you think if in that situation, after the three days passes and there's no money that's been deposited, it would be wise to still fill out a cancellation and release form so that everybody is clear on the same page the contract is? I can see where David's heading with this already. The answer is yes and no. All right, we want some clarity, but how do we cancel a contract when there is no contract? Right? And so, therefore, you may be muddying the waters by saying we want to cancel a contract. Oh, you said cancellation of contract. So we were under the impression that we had a contract when the whole defense from the seller side is there is no contract. Mm -hmm. Right? So you, I would say just deliver a notice. Hey, this is what my seller has told me to deliver to you. 
based upon the offer that was written on such and such a day, you had until such and such a time period to deliver earnest money. Because there was no earnest money delivered, all right, we are considering any of this transaction, not contract, null and void, and all parties are moving on. Uh, this is per my seller, right? And then do that. I would, I would stay away from calling it a contract so that you avoid that word. Okay. Are you with me? Good point. I mean, very good question, though. Okay. I mean, I like clarity, but I would like clarity outside of this form in this case. Okay. Yes. Moving around. Tom? Yeah. Uh, David, on, on this, uh, when you cross out and put there's an escrow to dispute, uh, I may be anal, but I would also cross out the word release anywhere in that document. Yeah. So there would be no misunderstanding by the parties mm -hmm. that it wasn't actually just a cancellation. Correct. Or even say, hey, look. All parties agree that contract is canceled, yet there will be further, you know, dispute yeah, over the I, earnest money or whatever. I mean, make I, it as clear as you possibly can. Just cross out all the words that say release. That's right. Exactly. And make sure you highlight the words that say cancel. Yeah. Right. Because we want to agree that this is canceled, but we're still, you know, that every, buyers go buy, sellers go sell. All right. But we'll fight about the money later. Yeah. It's kind of what we're trying to say. Over here, we get back Tom. Oh, okay. Um, so, okay, so in that scenario, what if the buyer says, I'm not going to agree to that? Yep. So they can handcuff the seller until the expiration? In my opinion, yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, if our legal hotline told one of our agents otherwise, I came back to our agent and said, I don't agree. Okay. All right, because my concern is that we don't want to be held to, and it's quite frankly, a lot of times it's the buyer's leverage. Right. Okay. So, but I say, look, okay, we've got another 28 days till closing. So, right. it's, so it's okay to, to list and go back to the market. You, you just can't sign a contract. Or if you sign a contract, you can't even, like, you can't even put it in active because yeah. now we're violating MLS rules. Nope. And I always point to Tom because he's our president, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right? Okay. It, it's still pending. That's right, because it's still a pending contract. And I get it. And that's the, the contract's canceled, it's still a pending contract. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, many times my advice to a seller is, yeah, yeah. Is it worth 2000 bucks? Mm -hmm. Uh, which you're not going to get anyway, because by the time we go to mediation and everything else, it's going to be whittled down to about $138. Okay? <laughs> Is it worth $138 bucks to keep your house on the market, off the market for 28 days? Right? I get it. Right's right. And principles, I hear this all the time. It's not the money, Bob. It's a matter of principle. Yeah, whatever. Well, usually, yeah. Okay. usually you want to do this when it's three days before closing the buyer. That's when you want to do it. And then, uh, so, so, in this case, the guy that was dealing with this, was, was he finally came around after all this said, well, we're only four days before closing. I said, well, then write it out for four days. I said, I'm, I told you you can't activate it until we get the closing date. Once the closing date comes and goes, then the contract is 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 expired, mm -hmm. and now the seller can reactivate and, and resell and anything else, and we can even without this cancellation, anything signed. Okay, good questions though. Is every and, and this may be a personal preference, and again, you know, you, the far legal hotline told them otherwise. Go ahead and activate it, and I rang them back in. I said, well. They also said, remember that you push button number one yeah. when you call them? Yeah. It says, you understand we are not your legal counsel. You cannot hold us liable for anything we tell you on this phone call. Right? Um, so that's kind of where it is. So let's go here to Renee and Sarah. Um, what if they, you strike through and the seller is being difficult and he doesn't agree to initial? Can you say that seller refuses to initial the strike through? You or? can, but without it, then we're writing it out till the, till the closing date comes and goes. We, have a, we don't have an agreement. Without it, I mean, it's kind of like, yeah, you know, my seller struck through and said he wants 538000 instead of 438000 So can we just say that the buyer refused to initial that? Yeah, we can. And by that, we mean we don't have a contract, right? And so we don't have a cancellation unless all parties have agreed to one document and says, here's what's happening. And without it, we write it out to the closing date, and then at the closing date, then it, it expires, and we can all move on. But it's also that's where that's where your negotiations come in, right? By the way, all this stuff right here, all right. Let's just let's get our sales hats on again. These kind of situations, lock in, repeat to your clients, and therefore is your answer to Zillow's instant offer. Yada yada yada. All right. Do you really want that, Mister? Are you prepared for this? Let me tell you a story. All right. We had a situation. This is why you need me. I'm not saying you need, an offer, you need me to get an offer, all right? Or offer pad or whatever else is out there. I've been here for three days and I've heard 28 offer pad commercials, right? Okay? 
big deal, all right? Those kind of things are gonna be around. They are, I mean, I get it, you know what I mean? And, but they're gonna be around, they always have been. I saw a billboard, I was, we were coming into town, we drove in, all right, um, and right at there at the 275 where you're, you're uh, coming in from the, from the north, and right at that curve, you know, it, it's that 2% company or whatever, what, what do they call them, anybody hear them yet? Okay. Yeah, I don't know. All they are is a repeat. Tom, you were around. What was that yeah, EH like Realty it, it, or whatever that was back in? My owner used to be. Okay, so. exactly. Yeah, all these things. You know, this is nothing new, right? We just, okay, hey, you know what? How do we differentiate? Where's your value add to the marketplace? Right? That's what you have to propose is that, hey, look, I get it. I mean, I'd sell my 10 speed for no commission if I could. All right? You guys do the same thing. You guys, every time you go to trade in a car, you guys go, look, I'm going to do this on my own. Right? If I can make a lot more money, if I just put it out in front of my yard and, yard and someone drove by and paid me money, right? I get it. That's what the consumer wants to do as well. Fine. You're going to have to justify your 6%, all right? Or whatever that may be, because there's no price fixing. Any relationship with commissions, we do not price fixing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is being recorded, so I can always say we talk in, I trust. Beautiful yeah. story. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, Good. I mean, all great questions, though. So, David, anything? Anything else? Last minute. We got about probably two minutes left. With okay. Yes, Lee. So, if you're dealing with this cancellation, and you get the buyer and seller to agree that they're going to cancel contract, but argue about the escrow later, is it a good idea to have the agents initial this as well? And should we be notifying the broker when the situation happens, just so they're aware? Even though we don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't hold it. Yeah. We well, we need to know about a cancellation of contract. Sure. All right. So that I can therefore, yeah. you know, do it. I, as agents are not parties to a contract, right? Yet, agents and brokers are party to a potential escrow dispute because the contracts and our listing agreements do say that we do have rights to escrow, yes. all right? If we deliver and everybody just backs out at the end of the day, then we can come up to, up to half and up to, the, you know, up, to, up to the full part of our commission, and you know how our listing agreement says all that. So I'm not so sure we'd have to initial this. It may muddy the waters a little bit by initialing this, but it wouldn't be a bad idea to get an acknowledgement. Well, I, I don't know if you need to do that at this time, but later on, when the earnest money is all hashed out, then the brokers need to waive their rights to their portion of the, or the broker really, because there's only one broker. You guys understand that? The listing agent is the one who has rights to that, to any commission, because we've had it on both sides. I've had, hey, you know what? Everybody backed out, this is wrong. You know, our, you know the other broker will call me, hey Bob, we want half of our commission. I said, well, you're gonna get half of what we're going after and we're going after zero, so have fun, okay? <laughs> And it's totally at the end, we've been on the other side too, that if the listing agent decides not to go after it, taking legal means, then there is no rights to the buyer's agent's portion of that commission, all right? So, but in a total perfect world, we would have the brokers sign off waiving their rights to, so hey, yeah, the money's going all to the seller, to the buyer, half and half. I'm right, I usually do 10 to 20% of escrow. Yeah, letters. sure, you can put something in there, it's absolutely. In the listing agreement. If they agree, absolutely, it's in there. Uh, last thought, as far as making sure if you're on the seller side and getting that deposit, you represent people in front of the Florida Real Estate Commission, and what I'm always trying to do is make sure people are educated so you don't get charged with a disciplinary action. So make sure, I mean, if you're on the seller side, you have to, you have to bird dog what's the status of that uh, escrow payment. If it's not, if it, it's supposed to have been paid or you know, is it coming? Because if for some reason it doesn't get paid and your client doesn't like it, then somebody along the way could tell them, you know, they're, they're, the seller's agent is subject to discipline if they failed to make sure that the escrow was, was paid in. All right. So you just want to make absolutely certain, you know, just, you know, it's not victory. It's not victory once you get signatures. It's signatures plus payment of the escrow. Anything less, what we've all learned today, is not an enforceable contract. All right. And in addition to that, you can, your license could be disciplined because you failed to make sure that it got paid. You know, this idea of, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 days down the road, the escrow's not there. Yeah. It's not a pretty sight. 
yeah. it's not a pretty sight. But I want you to want to assure you that when in conversations that I have with Bob, Bob will not mention your name. All right? It's all, <laughs> exactly. it's all See, confidence. There were no names. I have all a right? friend. I have a friend who wrote a contract like this one time, Dave. And you know, I'm, I'm getting to the point where I'm saying, does this guy really have this many friends? <laughs> Right. Exactly. Well, yeah. th you know what? This is invaluable to have David because, you know, David is, um, thanks, David. Appreciate it. Right. He's the head counsel for uh, Gitter. It used to be GTAR, but they, they like to drop vowels around here nowadays. All right. So, um, uh, so Greater Tampa Realtors. So, uh, David's there and is extremely knowledgeable. He's represented several people in front of Freck and defended them and so on and so forth. So, extremely knowledgeable in these kind of things. So, this is a uh, uh, really good stuff. And once again, utilize this kind of talk right here, this this knowledge, to accentuate the populace, the, the consumers need for you, right? Because this is your differentiator. This is what you do. Terry, you ready? I do. See, Terry, I told you you're gonna know when she comes in. <laughs> See, how are you? I'm Can I hand out? Oh, Maureen's doing all that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now remember, this is not a microphone to it, but it's just so that they can hear you on there. So oh. you still need it. I okay. know you don't need so to be told to talk loud. Okay. So you're good. Okay. 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 So okay. You can hold it. Clip it. I'm gonna hold it. Clip it. it. I'm just gonna hold. Awesome. Hi guys. How are you? Happy summer. Hey, I just got back from Vegas. I had the greatest time. I gambled. I didn't lose, but. The last time I was there, the slot machines were really slot machines. Now it's all this electronic stuff, and Michael Jackson's cool because when you start winning, it vibrates. I just like, I was like just beat it, just beat it. So it was great, so I had a great time. But anyway, guys, I'm here today to share a few points with you, and it's gonna be kind of an open book test, so make sure your phones are with you because at the end, there's gonna be a little bit of a test with prize, so pay attention, okay? So first I wanted to just make sure you know who I am. I'm Terry Pryor. I'm with American Home Shield. I have just started my 22nd year with American Home Shield, so I have a lot of pictures and things. I can get things done. Um, anyway, just want to make sure you know about our newest, our newest edition. It is a rekey. These are the new applications. Prices haven't changed, but we've added a rekey feature. What that means is any buyer that's going to get the American Home Shield warranty on their closing, they will have the opportunity to have their home rekeyed for the simple price of a service fee. Nice. <laughs> $75. We will rekey up to six locks, giving them four new keys. So we're very excited about that because we found out that a lot of agents do that as gifts. So if you're giving the warranty anyway or getting the seller to give it, whatever, they can now have it rekeyed. Want to make sure you know that the flyer's inside with all the details. Now, want to make sure you understand a couple of things about the warranty. Big, big, big advocate of buyer-seller coverage, you guys. I cannot tell you how many times I am getting called, probably averaging one a week, where a buyer's agent is calling me and saying, Terry, the warranty is going to be a part of the closing, but we just did our final walkthrough, and the AC is not quite working. Can we just wait until close? Yeah, the buyer call it here. <laughs> and I'm just like, what? You're breaking up. We're in a bad spot. Guys, if sellers have seller's coverage, we own that problem. We can go out and do those repairs, and the buyer's confident. The seller's not out a whole bunch of money. But if the seller chose not to have seller's coverage, then it is now a pre-existing condition, and it must be addressed or the buyer is going to walk into a home that AC isn't working. Questions? Do you get that? It needs to be addressed before it closes or it's going to have to be dealt with at the buyer's expense. Sellers could have it covered if we have seller's coverage. And guys, seller's coverage can be put on at any time during the listing, okay? Before or after inspection, and it's only an additional $75 that is paid at closing. Okay? So there's no money up front for the seller, and yet they can and have during a. During the inspection? Huh? Like during the inspection? Like the Not like during the inspection. Oh. You'd want to put it on either right before or yeah. after. If everything's beautiful, but there's closing's not going to be for another 45 days, the seller can have that coverage put in place and it protects them for the rest of that listing. My advice is always better to put it on earlier in the listing and that way if any breakdowns happen at all or if the inspection report finds things that we cover, we would take care of those breakdowns. Questions, comments? Okay, yes. Um, what if the 
the listing doesn't sell, what happens to that? That's such a great question. Okay, that is worthy of a prize. Okay. Okay, ready, ready, ready? Okay, ready? Okay, 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 sorry about that. Okay, so the question is, what if it doesn't close? Great question. By Florida state law, that policy is in place for the seller right now. They haven't paid, but it is in place. So that $75 would be required at that point, whether we did any repairs or not. We could have given them a brand new water heater, but they would owe the 75 whether it closes or not. Yes? And how long is that for? The, the initial listing is six months. If you need an extension, it'll be case by case. No, I mean, oh, I got you, okay. Is that what your question yep, was? You. How long is the listing coverage for? Mm -hmm. Up to six months. If you need an extension, it's case by case. Yeah, Sherry and I co-brokered a deal and the selling agent had listed the condo and he didn't take out any insurance like you're stating, but they did have to replace the hot water heater. Before closing? Like two days before closing because it blew out. Yes. So Covered. Yes. And if we were to sell an agent, what would it cost us if we wanted to give that to them? The seller's coverage? You know, for getting the listing. Well, the seller's coverage is $75. It starts the moment you order it, but it is not a standalone product, just so you understand. It has to be ordered because you're going to be marketing it to the buyer. The seller's coverage is the option that they have available to them, okay? And it is a beautiful thing. I can tell you guys it'll hold a deal together, and I get a call at least once a week, average, where it's right before closing and there's been a breakdown, and the agent's like, what can we do? And I'm like, get it fixed. There's really nothing else you can do at that point, okay? So I want to make sure you know that. Okay, on the back side, Guy, are the pricing, but I want you to look down a little bit. We also do new construction. Now, new construction, I'm going to tell you, is the hardest sell. Why? Why would it be the hardest sell? The, the home builder's given them a year and it's so new, we don't really need it. So here's how it works. That price, as you can see, is a little bit pricier than the regular warranties, but look to the left in parentheses. It starts on the anniversary date of the buyer buying the brand new home. The builders have that first year. Our policy kicks in for year two, three, four, and five. It is a four-year program for that price. Now, it's still not an easy sell, but here's the beauty of it. With a regular resale home, the buyer has to make a decision within 30 days of closing whether they want it. If the seller didn't give it to them, if they didn't make up their mind before closing, they've got th a 30-day window. <sighs> but with a new construction coverage, they can call them up to the day before their anniversary date and get it put on. Why is that a benefit for you? Yeah. It's a reason to call them all through the year. You need things to talk to them about, not just Christmas cards. Call them. If, how many of you are selling new construction homes right now? Anybody? Really? Oh, see? It's a reason to offer you to call them and say, hey, just wanted to say, how's it going? But just remember, you can have that extra long extended warranty if you want. And if they happen to sell within the next couple of years, you now can, uh, when you list it again, you've got the, the uh, listing to be included with two or three years, whatever's left on the home, because it'll stay with the home. Questions? Comments? So I saw on um, the sellers, um, I'm going back, so okay. Uh, yeah. So I saw the sellers that indicated it's subject to a survival on the path. Yes. Yes. So let's say that a seller gets the warranty from $75, and let's say that was all the air conditioning goes out. Right. What would happen? The first step we're going to do is try to repair it. We are a repair company. If for any reason we have to say to the buyer or the seller, we're sorry, it has to be replaced. They would be subject to the $2,000 limit and we will write them a check for the $2,000, okay? Buyers do not have that limit, but remember, if it doesn't close, how much do we get? $75. So we're giving them a limit. The seller's coverage is limited to $2,000, okay? 
So good question though. Okay, so here's the last thing I want to share with you guys. So, uh, new construction coverage. The last thing I want to share with you is a reminder will you pass out that there is a little payday for you when you close with American Home Shield. There are steps that you have to take after closing. I have the instructions up here, but for some reason FedEx didn't get them all stapled, so I didn't want to just hand out loose papers, but I have them here. Guys, if you have closed with an American Home Shield warranty within the last 60 days, reach out to me so that I can show you what you have to do to get that money. There are se There's more coming. There's more coming. I'm sorry. Um, so here's the thing. There are three different levels of, of cash that you can earn. Talk to me about it. It's called the Warranty Link Program, and it's something that you have to go back into after closing, okay? But it must be done within 60 days after closing or the opportunity is gone. Okay, questions? Okay, get out your phones. Here we go. We're going to play this game. Get out your phones, and I want you to go to the website, Kahoot, K-A-H-O-O-T dot I-T. But they, they go to something a little different. But yeah, pull that up for me. Yep, and then I go from here. All right. Okay, I'm going to give it to you guys. Hold on. Go to Kahoot dot I-T. Come on, play. Okay, so here's where it is. Go to Kahoot, K-A-H-O-O-T-I-T, -O -O -T, and you should get a thing that says enter a pin, okay? And here's where we go. Hold on. This is like Applebee's. Okay, <laughs> classic. You can have our team okay. a little trivia. Ready to plan. join? Okay, Kahoot.it. This is your pin number. Here's the website, Kahoot.it. And you're going to put in this website. You guys at home can play too. And when your names are entered, you're going to see your name on the board. So we're going to give you just a couple of minutes to get in. E, Tech, Mo. Are all you guys here? Or are these people playing at home? Tom. Erica, Florida Lee. Joseph, are Now, part of this thing is when you, you're going to have to look up here to see the questions. Your phone's going to give you a color code. There are going to be four colors. The answers that will come up, there'll be multiple choice. You'll have to do it by color code. Speed is key. Correct is also important, but you have to be correct and fast. All right? Anybody not in yet that's, that's trying to get in that wants to play? Okay. In? Oh, I don't want to. I will. I will wait. Any everybody in that wants to play? Well, I won't. We got things to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. These are questions. Eight, eight three five zero oh, one. Holy smokes. These are questions about future home realty and American Home Shield, and see if y'all were paying attention. Are we ready? Okay. Here we go. First question. Who is the founder of Future Home Realty? Ronald McDonald, Robert Redford, Roger Rabbit, Robert McDougall. You better not get this wrong. I signed your check. <laughs> <laughs> So who got it right? Who gave <laughs> Okay, let's see. Okay. LJ is in the lead. Who's LJ? Where's LJ? I. Oh. All right. You, you cannot win. So, okay. Okay. Next, here we go. She's stealing your technology. I know. What, I know this. Can seller's coverage be ordered after inspections? Were y'all listening to me? Oh, well, yeah, but this, yeah, yesterday they could do symbols too. In case you're colorblind, you could go by the symbol. Yes, and it's paid at closing. Nice. 
Who got this wrong? Were y'all not listening to me? Uh, come on. They missed me, too. Okay. All right, hold on. Here we go. Oh, Shelly the winner. Who's Shelly? Uh, ah, okay. okay. All right, here we go. Next question. How much does the new AHS rekey plan cost? Am I in anybody's way? I'm sorry. It's some pretty cool music. Who designed this? That's what I I don't know, but I love it. Isn't it fun? $75. Remember, guys, the buyers can have their home rekeyed, and I had an agent tell me just yesterday that they called on the day of closing, and they were out there the very next morning. So I'm not saying that's going to always happen. Just, just, yeah. it, it is. Right just want, just, just want to make sure y'all know it's obviously working. Okay, two people got it wrong. Is this just because y'all are trying to be Ronald McDonald still? Okay, whatever. Okay, let's see. Oh, still winner. All righty, here we go. Next, new construction plan covers for how many years? How many years does the new construction plan cover? from the anniversary date. Remember, the builder's warranty starts that first year. Ours kicks in for the next four years. Five people. Okay, you guys. Let's see. Shell. Whoa, it's still close. Nikki's, Nikki's pretty close. All right, here we go. Future home realty philosophy is work hard, make lots of money, make a lot, spend a lot. Earn more, keep more, make lots, means having lots. Yeah, this is good. You guys, I don't know if you guys know this one. Let's see. Actor wage. Huh? I was reading it. Oh. I got this off the website, so. Earn more, keep more. It's all over the website. Nice, yes it Okay? Is. That's a great philosophy. And four people got it wrong, so. Oh, wow. Well. That's Make, not. Making lots <laughs> means having lots. I like that. We can change it. We can kind of, yeah, you can kind of, can kind of change it a little, right? Okay, leaders are still intact. Let's see who's next. A home warranty protection plan. Now you need to read this. Covers for catastrophic occurrences. Protects homeowners from breakdowns. Will pay for all home repairs. Replaces roofs. Protects homeowners from breakdowns. Nice. Oh, catastrophic guy is usually covered through homeowners insurance. Okay, let's see where we are now. Same leader. Oh, oh LJ, LJ bumped up. She knows. What happened there? All right. I took too much time. I guess. I see. All right. Sellers coverage. Another one you need to read. Sellers coverage. Comforts knowing their budget is protected are subject to a $2,000 cap, has a required $75 cast, all the above. Ah, uh, the speed people. Give me all the answers. Uh, all the above. We are subject to $2,000 cap. It's $75 must be paid. And it does comfort them knowing that their budget's protected. Ten people got it. I mean, eleven people got it wrong. Oh, y'all went fast, right? Y'all just read. They did. They read that two thousand. They... Yep. Let's see who's. Where's the lead now? Ooh, LJ. You cannot. Would you stop? No kidding. Okay. Dirty <laughs> Thank you. Y'all heard that, right? No. Okay. That's on video too. Okay. How many future home realty offices are in Florida? Oh. And I got this off the website too, so if it's not up to date, no, it's right not right. my fault. <laughs> How many of you guys know this? Seven. That is right. 
18 got it right. That's good. Yes. We actually have more. You have more? We have more with branch offices. Well, yeah, but that's not. Those are more. Uh, more uh, <laughs> well, I went to the website. Yeah, I know. You go to DVTR, we got a lot. We got a lot. Oh, LJ's still yeah. in the lead. Let's take the camera. That's right. LJ. Nice. How'd you know that? No, I didn't know it, but I still. You still got it right? Points. See? Look at that. She's just way ahead. Awesome, AHS warranty covers four. Lightning damage, rusted corrosion, power surges, zombie attacks. Y'all seen our commercial? Yeah, I The zombie couple. Yeah, right. I couldn't spell apocalypse, so I said attack. <laughs> Rusted corrosion. So guys, if anything is rusted and corroded, that doesn't mean anything. If it doesn't, that is covered under our plan, okay? But zombie attacks are not, okay? That's right. LJ's still in the lead. Esther, though, you're gonna get the default because LJ can't win. Who are your favorite warranty reps? I didn't. LJ, what are you gonna choose? I actually need, I didn't do this one right, but anyway, Terry Pryor and Jeff Davis. It better y'all better all get this one right, but. <laughs> okay, so everybody got it right. Smokes. Okay, LJ, you are disqualified from winning. I'm sorry. Who's next? Uh, Jeff. No, Esther. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. Esther. Uh, Esther. Where's Esther? <laughs> okay, so Esther. Now it comes down to this, Esther. You get what's in this bag, or lunch with me. <laughs> Eeny meeny. Lunch with you. <gasps> Well, guys, thank you. I will set up a time. Okay, in closing, I just want to share this with you guys. I told you all I went to Vegas, right? Well, I went over Mother's Day weekend, and my kids for Mother's Day got me a ticket to see David Copperfield. And I just love magic. And he was here, and he was there, and he was disappearing. And it was like, oh, my God, it's awesome. But anyway, I just want to make sure you all know I will not disappear. I am here for you. If you ever need me, I will be there. Thank you so much. I appreciate your business. And let me know how I can help you earn your money with American Home Shield. Thank you. Thank you. Chabelle. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. The grip had my cards. Okay, I'll make sure I get one. Ah, see? Look at that. Only the winners get to have lunch. So that's it. <laughs> you got to earn the right to get her contact oh, information. Cards, so okay. I'll leave those for you. Okay, perfect. All right, so she'll hand Thank those out. You. Awesome. Great job. That was kind of fun. I like that little uh, uh, trivia thing. That's that, that was cool. Very nicely done. Lee, are you ready? All right. Hey, Darla, while, while Lee's coming up. So I got to tell you, Darla was agent number one, right? Darla Wright was back in the day, uh, one of now over 1,200. And also, something you don't know about Darla, but she gave Joseph his first haircut. Aww. All right. And see? And there, turn around, Joseph, so, you can, so she can see you. So there she is. All right. So. Um, in our office, in our Palm the old Palm Harbor office, I remember you with a towel around his neck and everything else, and Darla, uh, you just got hair, so, very good. Janina, Hi. how are you? Just speaking. Good, Lee, you coming? What are you, putting your PowerPoint together now, or what? Okay, well, let's go. <laughs> oh, see, look at that. You wonder why we talked, we talked to our top agent, she's, you know, just negotiated a deal while in the last 37 seconds, <laughs> haven't you? Sure. All right, good deal, have a seat. Thank you. So, Lee Lagu is here, and she asked, what do I say, right? That's always get the, what do I say? We just say, you know, what kind of interview, but if you got something you want to talk to us about first, and then I can t ask you some questions, and they can ask you some questions, you tell us. How do you want to do it? Okay. We'll, uh, we'll, well put this between us. Actually, this is, uh, this is a, uh, a prop for, uh, I'm the chair of International Council for Greater Tampa Realtors, and we have a fabulous meet and greet that's a free event. Nice. We will have, it's coming up on the 20th, I'll sort of pass these around. Uh, it's coming up on June 20th at 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. And this is a, you, it's kind of a cocktail party sort of thing. We have food and drink, people's is catering, there'll be wine and beer. 
and it's all about Panama and about the business between the Port of Tampa and the New Canal. There'll be Port of Tampa people there. We'll be having a nice presentation on Panama. It's only about 15, 20 minutes. Carlos Fuentes will be talking about it. And there'll be a lot of information about real estate and the real estate connections and how you do business between but it, business in Panama, but also Panamanians doing business in the United States, awesome. and particularly the Bay Area, which is a big connection for them. So, uh, very good. We'll pass those around. Awesome. Very good. So, Lee, you're involved in um, leadership at, at Greater Tampa Realtors, right? Yes, I am. What uh, you hold a position of? A board of directors. Board of directors. Tom, are you on board of directors right now as well? Okay, so we got a couple board of directors uh, with uh, a Greater Tampa Realtors um, and and some other stuff. So. You want to talk to us or you want me to just ask you some questions? Um, you can ask me some Okay. Questions. How long are the business? Uh, 10 years in general real estate yep. and about 30 um, <laughs> in construction and project management, construction management. So I've worked on everything from um, sports venues like Raymond James Stadium, World Golf Hall of Fame up in St. Augustine, the Ice Palace. Uh, I was uh, working for contractors who were the owner's reps on those uh, engineering and design firms and also in residential home building. I worked for Westfield Homes and Richmond American Homes. Awesome. So did you did you sell in, a, in, in marketing or did you marketing. were you on site? I never worked in sales okay, before so you were I on came site. into general right. real Okay, estate. cool. Yeah. Awesome. I don't think I knew that it about you. See, that's why I invited you here so I can learn more about you. <laughs> So that okay. So construction background. Have, yes. have, where, where did that come from? Any? Uh, started from when I my first job out of college. I worked for Zern Industries Cooling Tower Division. They built the parabolic cooling towers for nuclear power plants and uh, scrubber stacks for utilities. Like we did Big Bend, Crystal River. Washington the public power supply all over the country. You know, I thought like you had a glowing uh, personality, but now we understand yeah, yeah, why right. you're hanging around those nuclear reactors that long. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, See? That's it. Yeah. I don't know how close so, I want to get to yeah. you. Say, I'd say. Um, yeah. it's not good. So that's so ten years ago, so what drove you into real estate then? Uh, well, the the last construction work that I did was with home builders. Well, okay. of course, they crashed and burned, and you know there was no jobs. So I started doing. Uh, I had a lot of marketing and accounting skills from the jobs that I did at yep. construction firms. So I had a broker friend who wanted me to come and do some office work for her because I couldn't find a job. So. Um, after I worked for her for a couple of months, she's like, well, why don't you just get your license, you know? Um, you can do this, you know, because I never saw myself as a salesperson at all. I, I didn't, I thought that that's what real estate selling was all about. And I, I do marketing, but I'm not selling. So yeah, I started working with her and I started to realize that it was really more about the same approach that I'd always taken in marketing, which was that it's about the client. It's not about you. It's not even about the builder. It's about the customer. And it's about what they want and what they're looking for. And you need to show them how your product can solve that problem for them. So, and, and how you can help them through these processes. So once I started to realize that, I thought, well, you know, maybe I could do this. So I, you know, I got my license and started just working. And frankly, I was had spending a lot of effort like writing resumes and sending resumes and trying to get job interviews. And I did that for like two years. And I never got anywhere. I had like two job interviews in two years, and even the un even the temporary firms were going out of business so quickly that you literally would register with them, and a couple of weeks later they'd be gone. Right. You, Just, could, you couldn't even get a temp job. Right. So I I was this is the first time in my life that it ever happened. So I mean it was a pretty bad job market. So I started realizing this. So I started working with some buyers, and I actually got made some money. So I, I started thinking, okay. If I put more effort into the real estate, maybe we can actually make some money and awesome. stop worrying about the job hunting stuff, you know? So instead of spending all the hours that I was spending job hunting, I just started focusing on real estate and eventually I, you know, built up to a, a pretty decent business. And she does a great business and caps with us. By the way, we always interview our capping agents, those who, uh, you know, uh, hit what we would, you know, say our max is, right, as far as their contribution, which means you're doing at least. 14 and 15 deals a, a year on the on the on the uh, low side, and, and many do more than that. Where um, do you know your volume from last year by any chance? 
Um, last year, I think I had about 26 closings. 26 closings. Awesome. Very good. Last year was the best year I've had so far in general. That's it's fantastic. Made and about as much as I've made at my best year in marketing. That's awesome. It was pretty good. I had, I was a senior account rep for an advertising firm the last year that I was working with building. Right. So, yeah. yeah, and see, but here's the other thing. Okay, here's the beauty of barely hearing her is that isn't it great that that type of personality can sell 26 homes? <laughs> All right, seriously, remember we talk about in 100K where I come out and said, Hey, look, I'm gonna scare three fourths of the people away when they walk into my open house. All right, because I just, you know, I'm like bouncing off the walls and everything, but there's the other one fourth needs a calming influence. It's that whole disc profile, right? So we'll ask you to speak up a little bit so we can uh, they can hear you a little bit. But you know what? I mean, I'm just telling you that I guarantee is if you enter if we interviewed her clients, it's like you know what? Lee just stays calm through the whole process. She can can't get rattled. You know, where as me, I'm like, what are you talking? You know what I mean? I'm just you know hyper, right? She's just like, hey, look, this is all okay, right? We're gonna we're gonna make it through this. So that's that's a great thing. So, um, speaking of which, then, so 26 deals. Where did those come from? They fall out um, of the sky, or not hardly. Okay, um, it does. It takes a lot of mining. Um, I do spend uh, Sherry Lowry and I share uh, the wagon wheel flea market uh, real estate booth called the uh, Bank Foreclosure Open House, and uh, I'm out there. Well, every other weekend, so. I, that that is a really good way to meet people because it's face-to-face -face connection which is something they don't get anywhere else and I find that a lot of the people that you meet that way they will continue to work with you sometimes they're far out from being ready because obviously they're coming to the flea market they're not necessarily looking for a home but if they stop to talk to you in that booth they're clearly thinking about real estate in a serious enough way that they're actually going to stop and chat with you and give you their contact information. So I've actually built my database up to about 1,500, which I need to weed out because that's way too many. But, um, but it does show you, you know, what you can do. And then the other is just referrals I've built. Because of my business background I'm, and Bob's fantastic training about uh, an investor speak, mm -hmm. uh, ROI and cap rates, um, understanding those things and being able to work with investors. So probably about my business about half and half, investors and uh, regular homeowners. I do focus primarily on residential real estate. Um, and I don't do uh, short-term uh, rentals, right. which in Pinellas County is kind of a big business, but I refer that out. Um, and so that's that's my client base. And the thing about investors is they're repeat offenders. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, uh, they always come back. So most of my investors have bought two, three, four properties from me. That's a beautiful thing, right? You get an investor. That's what the, the beauty of working with an investor is you get somebody that knows what they're doing and is truly does have cattle behind their hat. Remember we talked about mm -hmm. you've got some investors that are all hat, no cattle, yeah. right? But actually somebody that, that uh, actually has some cattle uh, as well that they're, they're willing to go, it, it can do that. So tell me a little bit about then, because we, we teach a lot of that obviously in 100K, is all about getting face-to-face -face with people. We, we have a mantra that face-to-face, -face, eyeball to eyeball will be, will be pixel to eyeball any day of the week. And what I mean by that is all the greatest Facebook ads in the world are never gonna compete with someone getting in front of someone, shaking their hand and saying, how can I help, right? With sincerity in their eyes and, and the way, you will win every time, guys, and it takes no money, right? That's why we promote open houses so, 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 so much is because now they might thought they had a realtor they were working with, but now they've met you, game over, right? And that's where you wanna go. So. That, and, and, and I understand at the um, flea market, so maybe a little bit, not, I, I wouldn't say it's significantly different than the open house, but maybe it's just a tad, because at open house, at least they're, they weren't looking for stun guns and then you know end up being, hey, uh, here I am, right? Exactly. But at a flea yeah. market, they're looking for a stun gun, yeah. all right, and then all of a sudden they happen onto you. So walk me through that conversion of somebody that's, that's you know, comes into that. So, so typically they're wandering around the market and they're out there looking for whatever it was they came out there for. And you're, 
as we all know, there's always a certain percentage of population that's thinking about or looking at or is interested in real estate. In fact, most people really are. They're interested in real estate at some level, whether it's about their own home or they're thinking about making a move or a change. So they're out there for a different purpose, but then they find you and their interest is piqued by the fact that they're bank foreclosure properties because because that's what they all think are, you know, the great bargain of the day. So they want to see those, and they're interested when they see the kind of properties. We have a whole bunch of flyers that show like a big a variety of price ranges and types of properties in areas that most of the people are interested in when they come to the market. So they, you know, they see that, and they'll start chatting with you about the market. A lot of times they'll say, oh, what the mar what's the market like? Or they'll say, oh, I really like this neighborhood, or this house was down the street from me, or you know, whatever it is. And you start up a conversation with them about, you know, sometimes you direct them to the different parts of the booth. Sometimes you just ask them, hey, are you local? Or are you from someplace else? So, of course, at that market in particular, because it's close to the beaches, you do get a lot of people that are um, uh, tourists that are here, you know, snowbirds, especially in the wintertime. And, and you just chat with them about, you know, where they're from, what their interests are, if they have a favorite neighborhood in the area. And, um, and listen to you know, what they're telling you about you know, where they're from, what their interests are. And it's kind of surprising. Some of them will just totally spill their guts. <laughs> they just start talking about you know, where they're from, what kind of house they'd like to have, what they'd like to do in Florida, you know, and what they're able to do. Um, and, it, you know, it just clicks with them and they're thinking, wow, you know, and they'll ask you some stuff about the market. And then, you know, when they can see that you are knowledgeable about the different market areas and the types of homes, what the prices would be, what they can expect in the market area, um, they'll generally, they'll ask you, hey, you know, can you send me properties or how can I get this and more information? And that's when you can, you know, you get their contact info. You don't go in like, like right away and say, hey, sign this thing. You know, you, you get into a conversation with them. Besides, you don't want to waste your time either. You know, you want to be talking to people and conversing and getting information for people who are interested, who have some interest, whether it's, you know, this month, six months, a year from now, whatever it is, you're building mm -hmm. that, uh, that flow of, of business and, and clients, prospective clients. You know, and the key, what I just heard her say as well is, uh, well, first of all, you're not going to convert everybody, mm -hmm. right? Because you don't want to convert everybody, quite frankly. And the second thing is, um, part of the other thing we teach in 100K is these bank foreclosure open houses. And that's actually where the first booth stemmed from, right? Was back in the day, all right, was the whole idea, hey, look, let's, because I was teaching SIP Bank Own. And why bank foreclosure open houses? Why? Because they generate more traffic, all right? So you don't have to be as good. Because the more traffic you have, the less your conversion rate needs to be in order to be able to still sell homes and to help people. And the beauty is too, is once you get a lot of traffic, you by nature get better. The better, you know, more chances at doing anything, right? I'm a terrible bowler, but you give me enough times, I'll figure it out, right? Okay, and so give me enough, uh, enough opportunities. So if I'm going to open house where I meet two people or an open house where I meet 20, I'm going to go for 20, right? It's just a, it's just a matter of it comes a numbers game after a while, yes. and you're going to eventually meet the right people, but the key is getting in front. And the other thing I heard from her, and I think you guys picked up on it, is it's all needs-based, Right? Remember, we don't call ourselves uh, real estate salespeople, we're real estate consultants, mm -hmm. and there's a difference, right? If I'm gonna consult somebody, I'm gonna help them, I'm gonna guide them to the correct decision, right? And that's not the decision is, I need a commission, all right? The decision is, what's best for you, okay? And it, sometimes we've talked people out of buying, right? Hey, look, this is not the right time for you. I'm, the way I'm reading it, Okay, I, I don't think that this may be the best for you right now. Let's come back and revisit six months from now or whatever that case may be. But that's what a true consultant does. And a true consultant will end up getting five sales out of every sale. Because now you're already starting to feed off the right. repeat business that you've had and so on oh, and so yeah. forth. Yeah. So A lot of referrals. That's awesome. How about you guys? Questions for Lee? Anybody? Help with Tom. Um, what systems or products do you use that you can't live without and why? 
Uh, so primarily, I just started using Top Producer because I got it as a bundle with some things that I have with Realtor.com, and um, it, it's promising. Um, I'm also looking at some other CRMs. Um, I have primarily been using a sort of a old school paper. I mean, the, the leads are filled out from the flea market. The leads are filled out on paper. So I keep an alpha file with uh, the contacts and I use a ticklers in my calendars to just say, okay, you need to call these guys, these guys, these guys today, you know, and, and this is when I promise to follow up and you know that. And I, the, the other system I use is a, it, there's two things that I do when I'm working in my office. One of them is a time manager that I learned from an, it's, it's called the Pomodoro technique. And it keeps you alive. Isn't that a sauce? Alive. Like an it's a sauce? tomato. <laughs> and it comes from the tomato. Okay, from, thank you. It's from the mechanical tomato timer in the kitchen. Ah, okay? got it. Okay, got it. And it actually was, it an, came from an Italian university, a time See? study oh, yeah. thing yeah. that they did. And what they learned was that you can focus and be very efficient for 25 minutes. And then you need to get up and walk away from your desk for five minutes. And back away from whatever it is you're working on. And if you do that all day long, your efficiency level and your productivity will go way up. So the, that's one thing I do. I've also, and later, now, we've also learned, I guess American Heart Association says that this is a big thing in like desk people that like sit for hours that they have like really high heart attack rates. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons is this thing actually helps stop that problem. The other thing that I do is I, it's a training thing that I got from listening to tapes from, you know, the recording stuff. So mm -hmm. these were from, um, it's somebody that I know that you like a lot. Um, he was one of the big sales training guys from back, back in the 50s. He was on the radio all the time. Uh, was it Zig Ziglar? Uh, not Ziglar, older uh, than Ziglar. Older than Ziglar. Ziglar. Before Ziglar. Peel. Anyway, um, no, he's a business guy. Um, no, I'll think of it. In a we'll get anyway, it. Anyway, right. he, he had this technique where... Napoleon Hill. They... It was, he's a Napoleon Hill guy. Okay, gotcha. Okay. So, so we're getting closer. We're getting yeah. more. So right. the thing is, he's somebody asked him, a, a very high level manager at a big company, big corporation, asked him how he could raise the efficiency of his senior executives. And he said, Tay, I want you to take a, you got a three by five card or whatever, take it out, and I want you to write down the five most important things that you could do tomorrow that would help your business. The things that would make business grow or bring money into the five most important things. Write them down. Now I want you to rank them one to five. And tomorrow morning when you come in your office, I want you to do those things in the order that you numbered them, whatever the, the frequency level. I do that every day. In That's fact, awesome. I, I actually like that plan now, it out. I plan it out. I, and Michael Meyer talks about this yeah. a lot too. And I just, I just use a legal pad uh -huh. and I just write it down. The stuff that it needs to get done and then I rank it up. I figure out my Pomodoro takes these a half an hour blocks, 25 minute blocks, figure it out and I figure out how much I can get done. Doesn't roll it into the next day. So that's how I make sure that I get everything done. That's great stuff right there. I mean and and it's I not some really cool app or anything else. All right, you know, I got your app. Get out a piece of paper, right. make a list, and get it done. All right? Yeah. Seriously. I mean, that's what it boils down to. All these apps, that's all they're doing, right? Yeah. All the CRMs in the world are Excel spreadsheets. Yeah, really. Okay? Yeah. You know, that with some reminders built in. Okay? And so, all that stuff, you know, sometimes, we, remember we talk about in, in 100K a lot, we, we talk about uh, quit learning and start doing. Okay, it's the implementation is the key. You guys already know what to do, it's just time to do. All right, you guys are too many times are wasting our time. Let's make sure our red pins line up next to our green pins, next to our blue pins. And then in a minute, well, it's, oh, those, oh, my yellow pads need to be over here and the white sheets over here. And oh, look at the time. It's too, I gotta go pick up the kids and now, you know, there's no time to make my calls or whatever it's supposed to do, right? Because it's, remember, it's, it's the George Patton quote. A good plan, executed today is far better than a perfect plan never executed right just go do it all right and you'll and you'll yes. figure it out figure out what works make your list and and get it done that is awesome stuff right there that really is good yeah. that's you know because it's and it's true and i love the 25 minute five minute thing too take some breaks reward yourself right 
None of us want to do a certain, and, and you know, it's the old, is it, you know, eat the frog first, right? If you're going to have, you know, you got to eat, it's on the list, is eat yeah. the frog? Yeah. All right, then let's eat the frog. All right, and get that bad boy out of the way, and then we'll just deal with the rest, okay? Um, so, you know, just get, get that done. That's a great question, by the way, Tom. Uh, anybody else got something for Lee? I want to say one thing real quick. Tom Scaglione is actually the person who started the bank foreclosure open house booth. He started the That's first right. one at Oldsmark. That's right. See, we got that is Thank back you. in the day. Very nice. Okay. He's, a, he's been a visionary since, I mean, holy cow. <laughs> he knew that Mustang convertibles were in before we knew what Mustang convertibles <laughs> even were. All right. That's perfect. Anybody else got any more questions for Lee? It's pretty basic stuff, isn't it? I mean, I'm just telling you, here's the key. Do you know who succeeds in this business? people who decide to succeed in this business, <clears throat> right? We look at all the numbers. I look at the numbers a lot, right? We got Keller Williams offices who train every 30 seconds, all right? And we've got, uh, uh, you know, uh, other offices who do no training and all points in between, right? And guess what? I can pick their office, run their report, and 20% did two million or more in sales and 80% did not. No matter, I don't care if you have training every other minute, all right? It's the ones that are gonna to decide to make it happen. I'm not saying training is not important, it is, right? But don't just overtrain and underdo, right? I'd rather you overdo and undertrain any day of the week, except not physical fitness training, right, Sarah? We, okay, we get up, follow Sarah on Facebook and she'll remind you, she's already, by the time you even are wiping the sleep out of your eyes, she's telling you, discipline's the key, I'm here at LA Fitness, and I'm like, gee, many Christmas, lady, give me a break. All right, you know. Only thing I, I have is I'm I'm, in, I'm on Central Time, so I can at least try and justify it that way. Well, let's see, you know, I'm, it's only 5:30 here. All right, so <laughs> at least I have that, Sherry. If anybody wants to join us, let us know. Yeah. We're yeah, if you're looking for some opportunities to meet people eyeball to eyeball, they're looking. They've got a a, a referral relationship because they are the, they've taken the risk and, and put the uh, ownership in the into the uh, booths because they have a booth here at Oldsmar and at Wagon. Wheel. Yeah, sure All right. It's a great way to just, you know what? What the heck? People, really? Come on. I was supposed to, you know, drive a Jaguar and wear a Rolex and hang out at the country club when I got my license. <laughs> All right. This is not what I had in mind next to the guy that's selling sham wows. All right. Okay. Or, <laughs> right. <laughs> Right? But uh, does it work? And if it works, it works. Yeah, they use the sham wow in their house. That's right. You get, got it. Now you want a place to use the sham wow? What if you could sham wow your own home? Right? Instead of the one you're renting. Okay? Exactly. Turn it into a positive and, and, and go make it happen. It's, it's just, you know, it's, it's that key. So, because um, it's, it's, it's that powerful, right? Um, any other last questions for Lee? And I get to run in late. So, this is, you know, I love to bring in, you know what? And it's funny, the people we bring in, we got such a diverse group. Right? We've got people that do things in such different ways and they all work because they work. Right? It's, you know, it's, it's really, here, and here's Lee just says, you know what? I don't know. I just, you know, make a list and get it done. I have a question. Okay. Yeah. Do you use home warranty? Um, it's a very self-serving question, yes, but go I ahead. Know, really. no, I I, 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 I do. Um, it's, I always offer it to clients. I probably work more with buyers than with sellers. So Absolutely. I offer it to them. Sometimes they're interested, sometimes they're not. But I'll offer it to them as a closing gift if they want it. I usually give them options. I, my clients are always in control, you know? Yeah. So they, they get options and they make the choices of what they want. Yeah. Perfect. That's a great, great advice in offering options. Yes, Jerry. This may sound like a self-serving statement, not yeah. question, but I've known Lee for some time, even though yeah. we're a former we worked at, company. We worked at the KW. Yeah. Uh, the red and right. black company. Okay. And, <laughs> You're and what Lee has uh, exemplified to me is when she works with an investor, as she did with this gentleman from Southern California, she sold him a triplex. So she came to us, we, did the, we do the property management. He's very happy with his property management. She's now just sold him a duplex and we're going to do that property management. So while it may sound like I'm trying to toot my horn here, it really isn't. It's, it's that if you find the right partner who is not in competition with you, but actually um, helps you and works with you, 
that also makes you a star because that oh, investor yeah. wants to buy more properties because they feel more comfortable. Is that right, Lee? Yes. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the Golf View has been great to work with on that, and and to give Jerry more than his due, and Al. Um, Jose is very, very happy, and that's the closing we're having today. Right. Um, is, and it's a lot because it makes it easy, and we do have a lot of opportunities for people. I mean, you're here in Florida, they come by the flea market booth, you meet them, and investors, I'll tell you, investors don't usually go by open houses that much. Right. They have a tendency to either drive around, if you meet them in a place like the flea markets where they're wandering around looking for stuff, they can be terrific clients, and I've met a lot of my investor clients there. Probably, actually, probably about two thirds. That's about awesome. Seventy-five percent of my investor clients are the ones that I met at the flea market. And to your point, they're repeat buyers too. And they're repeat yeah. buyers. Yeah, uh, they keep them happy and make yeah, it they're, happen. They're serial offenders. I love them. <laughs> love it. Good deal. <laughs> More questions. I got. We got two minutes left. Anybody? Last thing before we go. Sarah. Can you make a statement. Yes. Kind of a plug for American Home Shield. Yeah. So when I started selling in 2001, yeah. my, my rep in California, Mikey Miller, she was amazing. And after after closing, three, four months after closing, there's always that dreaded phone call, that buyer that closed. And Sarah, there's there's roots growing in our plumbing, yeah, right. right? Or our air conditioner, which is the biggest one in Florida. And it was so awesome for me to be able to say, Thank God we got a home warranty with American Home Shield, and we're, we're just going to pay that small service fee, yeah. and you're not even going to have to worry about it. So just, I mean, it's so invaluable that I would buy them for my clients. If they didn't want to buy one, it saved me that stress down the road. So it's, it's totally invaluable. I, That's all I got. Yeah, I, I completely agree. A home warranty in, in particular is just fantastic. You know, and it just gives them that peace of mind. And, and especially if you've got first time home buyers or people that, you know what, uh, you know, a $1,200 repair is going to really set them back. And your rep right? will go to bat for you. Right. You know, if there's a discrepancy or sure. whatever, she'll go to bat for you. Yeah. That's awesome. Good deal. Perfect. So, I mean, yeah. I, I put it on the con I represent buyers and I put it on the contract. Seller will pay for a home warranty for the buyers yeah. up to five ninety five. Yeah. Ninety nine percent of the time I get it. I right. negotiate it in the contract mm -hmm. for the buyers and, and I use Terry exclusively. Yeah. I probably I don't know how many we had last year, ten or twelve um, home warranties for my buyers. But she's fantastic. If you have a problem, call her and she's on it. Yeah. I mean I don't Unless she's in Vegas. <laughs> watching David Copperfield. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Good deal. Cool deal. All right. I know we ran. Yes, Janina. Sorry. Totally unrelated question. I just really want to know where the market is heading from you, Bob, mm -hmm. um, in terms of... Crystal ball. Where'd it go? <laughs> <laughs> go All right. In terms of in investors and investments, do you see the pendulum swinging back to the buyer side? Well, eventually, yeah. Okay, how long though? Right? What, what's that uh, pendulum shift going to take? It's right now. I, I would agree with Jerry that you know that we've got increasing rents mm -hmm. still, which is because we're undersupplied, all right? Which means we have a higher demand, and anytime you have a higher demand than supply, that's going to put high pressure on prices, whether it be rental prices and or housing prices. My goal and my hope, and my speak to this, Francine still in the room, um, to the lenders out there, is that we don't go the big short on us again, okay? Let's not go, you know what I mean? Let's buy responsibly, and if we get to the point where, hey, you know what, it doesn't make sense, and or the financials aren't there, because the only way to slow down a really, really hot market is if the lenders will stop lending or creating all these products to make up for the high prices and say, well, you know what, a 45 back end is probably all we want to go, but you know what? With prices where they are, we better start making exceptions because our comp competition is going to do a 63 back end. And next thing you know, the reason those 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 uh, uh, those ratios are in place is because they're pretty long standing. If we look at the actuary tables, all right, that said, hey, where's the risk in a foreclosure and so on and so forth? They didn't make up these back end ratios. Those back end ratios come from foreclosure rates when they go and analyze all the data and they say, wow, look at this pool of people. How come they were in foreclosure? Well, they put no money down and they had 57 back end ratios. 
That's a recipe for a foreclosure, right? And so my, my, my hope is this, is that A, we catch back up to, we get a, a, a better inventory a balance, because right now we're under, we have low, lower inventory and lack thereof, that we get a, a better inventory balance, and um, but we ease into that, right? And then we do it in that, that prices begin to modify because the lenders say, hey, look, we just aren't going to lend money on that, you know, or it might be worth it, and if the cash buyer wants to do it, that's fine, but with, if you read, a, a, what's his name? Way back in the day, uh, I have to think, he wrote, it's basically the wealth of nations. Adam Smith. Smith, thank you. All right. Adam Smith, the wealth of nations. All right. It's, it's an economics book, but it was written in the early 1700s. And he talks about, hey, look, that the economy can only go where wages and everything will equate, right? That the things make sense, right? If we get to, who mentioned California here recently? Somebody did. Okay, yeah. So California, I, I came from California, they get way out of whack. All right, there's just no way. They're, if you look at their economy, it is no way able to support a median house price of 487. All right, their wages aren't double what we have here. If we have an average, you know, median house price of 230 here, their wages are not double. As a matter of fact, when you take in the fact that they have state income tax and all that kind of stuff, it really doesn't come. So they are, again, recipe for disaster, and we want to avoid being that, right? And so, very long answer to your question is, it's going to take a while to moderate, but I think if we don't interfere, all right, let, let's let the government stay out of it this time and let things just kind of self-regulate, all right, Adam Smith will tell us that things will come into play, and after a while, it's going to take me trading my 12 eggs that I raised to buy your half a pound of ham. All right. What, what I've been reading, and I just kind of want to get your take on it because I do work a lot with investors. Yep. I think it's a good time to invest, if you're asking me. I, I, even though, now again, remember my theory on investing is not buying for appreciation, but buying for cash flow, right? If you go back and read the, or watch the seminars that we do on, is that investors don't buy properties, they buy cash flow, right? And so cash flow is there because there's an upward uh, pressure on rents right now. And so when you have upper pressure on rents, that's going to increase your gross income, which in, the, in theory should increase your net income, which factors into your cash flow, right? And so with that in mind, I think it's, it's still, even though with quote unquote prices high, it's still an okay time to invest for long-term holds, right? Because again, I don't care if I sell the home for, in 22 years, I sell the triplex for what I paid for it. I've made $12,000 a year on very little invested, all right, over the last 20 years. So if it appreciates, great. If it doesn't, that's okay too because I made $240,000 over the last 20 years in positive cash flow on that. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Good deal? You like that crystal ball? Uh, I still have some more questions. All right, we can talk about it later. We'll, we'll let everybody else go. Jerry. You know, uh, Bob, you brought to mind. I promise we'll be out of this is the last one. You guys, matter of fact, you need to leave. Feel free to leave. Don't, you're not going to offend us. I'm unoffendable. Jerry's offendable, but I'm unoffendable. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you brought to mind an individual that I know from uh, an investors group that I'm a member of. Mm -hmm. This gentleman is, uh, I believe, 80, 81 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, over his lifetime, he's assembled in excess of 300 properties that he has kept for cash flow purposes and his average price point is in the neighborhood of fourteen hundred dollars a month which is not a high price point no it's perfect but as his wife would tell you he hasn't worked a day in his life but he's a multi-millionaire mm -hmm. and what he's done is bought smart and held on his properties for cash flow and as she told me one day our kids are going to inherit all the wealth from all the appreciation from that 300 plus properties. Who wins Monopoly? Whoever has the most properties. <laughs> right? It's true, right? 
how do you go bankrupt a monopoly? You land on somebody's hotel. It's like, geez, again? And don't play with Joseph, by the way, all right? He is just vicious in monopoly. He will, he will you know, takes no prisoners. Sorry, Dad, you know what? How much does that watch worth? <laughs> all right. Okay. How bad do you want to win? All right. It's but that's who, it's so true, right? And that's what you do. And a lot of these investors, there's a reason why you sweep off four green houses and trade it for one red hotel, right? Think about it. There's my four duplexes, and now I decided to buy a 20-unit apartment complex. Okay. It hasn't changed since 1930, whenever Monopoly came out. It hasn't changed even prior when Adam Smith wrote his book. All right. Economy is the economy, and that's the way things work and it's the way it goes. So, um, all good stuff, by the way, and I could talk about this kind of stuff forever, so we will stop because I could uh, talk about cash flow and analysis of that for a while. That's what gets me excited about real estate. Any last questions? We, Lee, Tom, Joseph can answer for you. All right? Yeah. Um, I'm meeting with a flipper wannabe. Yep. Yeah. So you're, you're well, I got the flipper class. That's fast. Ready? Buy low, sell high. Have a nice day. <laughs> yeah. uh, and you're talking about, you know, lots of cash flow. That's where you're working. That's where the money is. Yep. I mean, I, I'm thinking. That's where long-term wealth is. <laughs> Flippers, I mean. I mean, I'm thinking right now with the prices the way they are. Yeah. It may not, you know, he's not going to get the $40,000 he's getting now. He may have to now. Not going to happen. Not really the, the, the formula is great. Buy low, sell high. The problem is, how do I buy low? Right. right. right? So with that in mind, let's switch. Now let me end it with this. It's, it's a great, to Jerry's point with the guy who built the 300 unit portfolio. Warren Buffett has a great quote in one of his books. And you guys have heard me. I, I quote it in that class when I teach it. Is that Warren Buffett got accused, and, and rightfully so, or, or took a lot of heat for missing the dot-com boom. Right? because he wasn't gonna buy companies that had no earnings. And that's all, that's what a Yahoo, all these, oh, buy Yahoo, you know, all these things in the mid 90s, right? He just said, look, I'm not gonna buy it. And here, here's, his, here's his quote, and it's awesome. He said, some people buy a 1962 Corvette, right, in 1990 for the hope that when they sell it in 2000, someone will pay them more for that 1962 Corvette. So they're buying for appreciation. He said, I, will never buy that 1962 Corvette, but, this is directly from Warren Buffett, I will buy a taxi cab. Why? Because a taxi cab can create cash flow, right? There are earnings associated with the taxi cab. So he goes, I can, I can quantify that, right? That thing makes 1,200 bucks a week. If that makes 1200 bucks a week, that's 52, 52, 52, 52 that's you know, 58,000 a year. If I'm looking for a 10% rate of return, I'm willing to pay $580,000 for, it. what? 580,000 for a taxi cab? Yeah, but it makes 1200 bucks a week. Cash flow's 58,000 a year. Oh, I'm getting a 10% a, a return on my money. So yeah, I'm willing to pay 500. Wow, that's crazy, right? Think about it that way, as opposed to just trying to hope somebody's gonna pay you more 10 years from now. They never buy for appreciation, they buy for cash flow. Would I, do you agree that you're investors? Yeah, no. The long buy and holds are, okay? Cool? We get out of here, all right? <laughs> Got any questions, let us know. All right, it's great to see you. All right, thank you, Lee. Thank you, all right, if you get a chance, say Lee.